FSP board member and has uh, been on the program, I think, about, about a year ago around this yes, time, sir, Gene, right? Year ago. Yeah, thanks for having me back on. Absolutely. Uh, I know you guys had a lot of stuff going on here, too, but first tell us all about your organization. So uh, the AFSP is the biggest nonprofit um, going out to make sure to prevent um, suicide and help with uh, mental health and behavioral health. Um, all the funding um, goes towards um, education, funding, um, resources, mm-hmm. and um, researching ways that we can um, battle it, you know, battle suicide, especially from all sorts of levels, from veterans to, to youth and adults. So, how, how did you get involved in this, Gene? So um, in April 11, 2019, I lost my daughter uh, to suicide mm-hmm. when she was 15, uh, less than 30 days before her uh, 16th birthday. Um, after getting through that, you know, um, I started like really going after, like, you start blaming yourself. You start trying to figure out like what I could have done better. And then it kind of led me to the FSP and then kind of creating, I also grapple for life since, Mm -hmm. um, uh, I practice jujitsu and I teach jujitsu. So, um, both kind of went hand in hand. So I, I did my first, uh, grapple for life event in Koreansville, uh, last year in may and that's how i um, met cindy who's the ch- uh, head chair in west virginia she came out and tabled at that event and then it's been ever since i've been working with him along with doing my own uh, activities mm-hmm. so, yeah. and you and you had an out of the darkness walk that you guys had, had done previously you have another one coming up yes we do we have another one uh, september 9th we moved the location from the war memorial park to um uh, shepherdstown to ramsey mm-hmm. the ramsey um, memorial park and that will be September 9th. September 9th. And how's yeah. that going to work? How will that uh, help you raise money? So basically, you can uh, you can join a walk team. You can come out. You can donate. You do not have to donate to come walk. Mm-hmm. So we actually want people to come out that's had any type of incident or been involved or suffered a loss or suffered themselves to come out. And then they can meet other people that, um, that have also went through it. Sometimes it's easier to talk to people that have you know, suffered a type of traumatic incident um, that's similar to yours and uh, t- to kind of heal and kind of work with each other that way. Kind of like sometimes it's better to have like veterans speaking to veterans about sure. uh, the traumas that they uh, suffered instead of just somebody that doesn't know or, or understand what, uh, what they went through. And uh, there's a Grappling for Life event coming up at the rec center too. Yeah, about, a, so, about a month from today. Actually. Yeah, actually August 26th, Saturday. Um, it'll be the first ever Grapple uh, for Life Invitational. So currently I have 30 matches. So I have a bunch of grapplers from all over West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland, um, PA. Like just all, they uh, reached out. I was actually not expecting this many, this much outpour in wise of like athletes to, to, uh, to participate. Many of them have suffered themselves or have suffered a loss. So it means a lot to them. So they're coming out. It's, uh, it'll be live streamed. But um, all the primary seats have been have been purchased already because all the funding goes back to the athletes, mm-hmm. and then it also goes uh, donated to the AFSP. So it's a charity event. Um, let's see here, with thirty matches, and then all ranging from youths all the way up to adults, from um, white belt all the way to black belt level competition will be there. So it'll be a good time. Very good, Mr. Gilstrap when the signs and symptoms of someone who is suicidal as i understand it obviously there's the the with withdrawal and depression and and all of that but you also can, also can mean a lot of other things so what should a loved one do if or a friend for that matter if you're just worried about the friend or or the loved one they're just not right they seem down they've just lost somebody in their life and and they're having a hard time putting things back together what do we do talk to them like sometimes we get like this phobia or this like weird stigma about like actually talking to people about a loss or how they're feeling right so there's this big misconception when i talk to legislators uh even here in west virginia in february where we actually got a house bill passed but there's still a big notion that like talking to people about suicide or like if they're feeling like they're going to hurt themselves or if they have um, thoughts of suicide is going to make them do it which is far from the case right so a lot of times the best thing you can do for um, people that are suffering like that is to give them time because a lot of times when there are people are reaching a certain point of despair 
they're, they're not thinking about anything, but you need to give them time to kind of get out of that, that dark zone and kind of start thinking a little straight. So um, the best thing to do is, is to talk to them and then get resources. So this is where like the 988 uh, hotline comes into play. Uh, there's also other resources you can get for behavioral health and things like that. And staying with them, talking to them, and monitoring that. What happens after the 988 phone call? So with a 988 phone call, this is one of actually the issues that we were, we're trying to fight right now is like follow up. Follow up care is actually one of the poorest things that happens with a um, with any type of even with a emergency response from like law enforcement or like you know ambulance when they come out is they'll do a soft handoff to let's say a hospital or something like that or an emergency room and then there's kind of like a little small intervention done then they're released and then there's no follow up. Like almost 80% of like hospitalizations for possible self-harm or suicide, there's no follow-up. So that's one thing we were um, actually last month when I went to D.C. to speak to um, legislators is asking for additional funding for 988 for what we call crisis intervention teams. So what they would do is they would go out do the, um, and they would help with the scene. So you'd have a counselor, you would have either a counselor or a therapist. And what we're looking for is like an unmarked an unmarked unit or an uh, ununiformed officer, obviously for safety reasons. And the reason we don't want uh, marked uh, vehicles with their lights on and stuff like that is we don't want people thinking that you reaching out for help is getting you in trouble. It's like automatically, I mean, like we know that they're coming out there not because you know you're in trouble, but it automatically there's a perception that you're in trouble. You have you know you have officers on scene. So what they're trying to do is. Are these specially trained officers? No, uh, no, they would just be there for safety reasons. They would actually not lead that whole um, situation. They would only take over if it became needed for like violence or there's an act of self-harm going on. But the lead would actually be the counselor or the therapist, and then there would be a soft handoff to the emergency room, and then there would be a follow-up after that, you know, usually within 48 to 72 hours. Mr. Harvey. It sounds similar to what we have, like the, our, our quick response teams yes. for, for overdoses. Um, is there something that, that you're aware of in the data that points to what is either creating this problem or exacerbating it in today's society? Um, a lot of the research, like, I don't have, like, numbers for that kind of stuff in ways of what's um, – I do know that one of the things, especially for the youth, is, is obviously social media. So social media has increased youth and especially uh, female youth um, depression rates. They went up much higher because there's a, it's a big facade. Another problem with uh, phones is also, um, like when we were younger, mm -hmm. let's say something silly happened or we got into a fight or something like that, it would, it would blow over in a week. The town might know about it, the school might know about it. Now everything goes viral, right? So now you're getting bombarded by yeah. Sort of, so and there's no quarter from that. Like exactly. you can't go home and get away from your bullies. Yeah. And strangers from, from a thousand miles away join the team of bullies. Exactly. Yeah. So like online bullying and all that other kind of stuff is, is adding, especially to the youth. So like we had our issues back then, but they have their issues now. And then um, another one that I find that is an issue um, is the number one treatment for non-medical treatment for um, – depression is exercise right but it's one of the things that has become removed from a lot of schools and it's also things you're not seeing as much anymore with kids participating in any type of outdoor activities you're starting to see a decline in that so i always tell people like um if you're not like doing some sort of exercise getting outside or you know trying to maintain eating some sort of like healthy nutritional diet you're not kind of giving yourself a fighting chance if you suffer from from clinical depression or anything like that. So you want to give yourself a fighting chance. Do you think the pharmaceutical companies have um, increased the problem with over-medicating our youth? Um, over-medication is like, that's something I don't want to speak on because like, I don't have a lot of information on that. So I've never really looked at the pharmaceutical companies and, and, their, and how they affect it. Um, I do know that um, drugs and alcohol abuse can raise the risk of um, of suicide ideology and depression, obviously, because, you know, when you're fighting an addiction, it can create because you don't feel like you're in control. A lot of times, especially men, when they don't feel like they're in control of their lives or a situation, it can create massive amounts of depression. 
Well, I'll go out over my skis on this. I, I think, without any data, just being in, around the, the sun a few times, on, um, I think there's a real issue that we don't let kids be kids anymore. That we try to, if they act out, we either medicate them or we punish them or we expel them or we call the cops on them. I think that the we've made childhood a very difficult thing for kids like I was, who we didn't have ADHD as a thing, but I'm sure that's what it was. You know, Johnny will not stay in his seat. Johnny will not keep his hands off others. Johnny will not keep his mouth shut. All this. And in your and, case, since your name is John, it was literally you. It was literally <laughs> me. Yeah. And, I can and see I, you being I, a problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I was, it was just... I don't. I don't know how the teachers dealt with it. I would not have, looking back, wouldn't have wanted to be my my teachers. Um, but you come through it because it's the kids being kids, and I think it's a real problem now that we over discipline and over medicate children. I have, I, you know, I, I absolutely agree with that. You're seeing a lot of school districts where they're uh, reducing like PE, like physical type of education. Mm -hmm. They're not. Uh, another thing is like the education system right now is not really geared towards young boys. Right, because yes. most most boys are tactile learners, where they want to learn with their hands, you know, like shop and things like that. You're starting to see a decline in tactile activities in schools. So what ends up happening is you're like, I have a hard enough time sitting in a seat for eight hours and just kind of like sitting still and things like that. And now you're asking a, a young child or a young young boy to do it, and then obviously now they're a behavior issue, right? So now they have the ADHD, they're hyper, um, and then sometimes it is the the medication. Um, that they start throwing at them, absolutely. So I think that's it. I think that's an issue. That's one reason I'm so big on like uh, like the martial arts teaching jujitsu and stuff like that is giving giving the youth an outlet into into some sort of sports and, and uh, physical activity. And, and so, with that comes a discipline. Yes, yeah. and it does come with discipline. Um, so it went as far as like I actually opened up a, a, a jujitsu school here in Martinsburg. Uh, on uh, 1211 North Queen Street, mm -hmm. and we opened uh, on the 22nd of this month. And Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Yeah. And so we have programs also, uh, me and my business partner, he's a, he's a veteran. Um, we have a veterans program, uh, law enforcement, fire, even teachers, and um, family programs and things like that. So um, we do offer... A lot of programs for and if you're um, if a child is let's say if I understand that funding can be an issue also for a lot of parents so that's one re one of the funding that grapple for life does is some of that money goes to help offset costs for tuition for kids that are uh, that have been diagnosed with depression and stuff like that if they can show us that you know that they're they're depressed they have issues like that we can help offset some of the cost of uh, having them join the academy well i think some of these underlying problems that would lead someone in our youth to do the ultimate act of committing suicide that you know that's probably the small percentage of the problems that it creates it's like a spectrum and then there's a lot of misbehavior and self-destructive behavior behavior that that occurs that may not ultimately lead in the suicide so some of these resolutions for uh, and solutions about getting exercise and and you know uh, amongst other things and, and potentially receiving medication don't have to be for someone you think is suicidal oh absolutely not it, it helps in general obviously so um so from the research i've done and then like looking into suicide when when people get into that point of that total dark place, right? They're not thinking of anything else. And a lot of times it's not a selfish act, you know, from uh, speaking to a lot of suicide uh, uh, attempt survivors, what ends up happening is they're in such a dark point where they actually think they're doing people a favor, that they're actually doing their loved ones a favor. They feel like such a burden and um, that they're causing more harm being here, which is obviously not true. Like we want them here, but they feel like they're in that spot. The best thing you can do for someone that they're in that mind frame is just being with them and like, they need time. They need time. And this is one reason, another, you know, initiative we're trying to look, especially here in West Virginia, because we rank kind of pretty poor as a state. We're, we're 10th in the nation for suicide per uh, capita, 100,000 people. Um, and from between the ages of 10 and uh, 34, we actually rank second. 
Well, What's the second leading cause of death in, in West Virginia? At, second leading cause of death is suicide? Between, between 10 and uh, 34. Whoa. Yes. So, and I, I would assume the first is overdose. Um, actually, I don't have, I don't have that one. Uh, usually first is sometimes usually accidental. But yeah, overdoses have increased quite a bit. There's a stigma. Yeah, absolutely. In, in our culture, not necessarily, you know, that goes beyond state lines that that you you're weak you can tough this out and and how how do we get past that i mean because if you look down and your hands were bleeding you'd go to the doctor yep but if you if your brain is misfunctioning you can just tough it out how do we get past that what we're doing right now we need we need to talk about it we need to get it out there it's not it's not discussed enough right so what ends up happening is the the misconceptions are still going on and that whole, you know, like, tough it out and all that. Especially, especially you know, like, you know, especially as, as men, we're told, you know, like, got to tough it out, be quiet about it and all that stuff. We, we have to get rid of that. Also, even even the terminology we use. Like, we, t we teach this program uh, called Talk Saves Lives, and it actually addresses something like that. Even the terminology, like, um, even the way we address it. Like, they committed suicide, right? But suicide shouldn't be looked at as an act of, like, a crime. You use the word commit with, like, crime. They committed yeah. a, a robbery. They com it's not. They died by suicide, right? It's not they committed a crime or something like that. So mm -hmm. even the way we term, it, you know, we term it, it's like a negative. We automatically put a negative persona on people that have died by suicide, which is wrong because, you know, when you do that, you're, you're adding to the stigma. Right? And isn't – I have heard that the window, the, the action window, people find they fall into that dark spot. Mm-hmm. But the suicidal window is is like twenty thirty minutes. That yes. If they get through that, then then they'll be on the other. Of course, timing the presence to be there at that particular window. Is time difficult. time is actually you, you hit it right on the head. Time is actually the the number one thing you need to give somebody that's in that dark spot, because they're not thinking right at that time. They're what's going on in the brain and the chemistry that's going on in the body is. They, they need time for everything to balance back out and for them to start thinking that there's there's other avenues besides what they're about to do. This is one reason we tell people, like, if you if you do come onto a scene or you're, like, dealing with someone that is at that level, is to remove any type of weapons and weapons of opportunity, right? So we're talking, like, knives from the area. Uh, if, you, if there's weapons in the house, getting rid of them or, or hiding them in a different location, securing them. And it's one reason we're asking for more, like, structural barriers um here in west virginia and actually throughout the nation like bridge bridge barriers ah yeah because what happens is like when you put the bridge barrier up because there's two particular bridges here in west virginia i apologize I, I don't remember the name of them i'm actually still new to west virginia i've only lived here um, a little over two years now um that has a high rate of um jump um uh, jump attempts mm -hmm. so and some of the bridges you see here do have uh structures like bridge barriers and nets but when you, the increase of those, they notice that like places that have a substantial drop because it buys them time. Because by the time they're dealing with that structure, they usually come back down into normal types of thinking. Makes sense. Uh, Gene Font has been our guest here on the program, a board member with the West Virginia chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And coming up on Saturday, the uh, August the 26th at the uh, Berkeley 2000 Rec Center, they'll have a Grapple for Life charity event. And then an Out of the Darkness walk scheduled for Saturday, September the 9th at uh, Ramsey Park. And uh, Gene, I appreciate you coming in uh, you as, as always. The, uh, the website to find out more is uh, AFSP.org. And you can find out more about what they do there. And uh, hopefully, uh, Gene, you'll have great turnouts for everything that you're trying to do here. Absolutely. Uh, also, my website for Grapple for Life, that's uh, grappleforlife.org. And that's with the number four. And that's how you can also uh, get tickets for the event. Thank you, Gene. Thank you. Appreciate it. All the best to you, sir. Thank you, sir.